Hello, friends. Welcome to Thinking on Scripture. My name is Stephen Cook. Today we're picking up in our next lesson in our study on the subject of soteriology. As usual, I will post a link in the description below for any of you that would like to have access to my study notes. They are available in PDF format. Uh, now, we are currently looking at biblical terminology related to soteriology. And in our last lesson, we talked about imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. This is the righteousness that comes from God to us on the basis of faith. At the moment we trust in Christ as our Savior, we receive the gift of righteousness. And Paul calls it that. He calls it the gift of righteousness in Romans 5.17. And, uh, and so justification follows nicely because we receive forgiveness of sins and because we receive the gift of righteousness, we can at that moment be declared just in God's sight. Uh, and this justification uh, is, again, studied, looked at from a soteriological perspective, that is, as it relates to our salvation uh, in relation to God. There is a justification in the sight of man, and that's what James is talking about. But what we're going to look at today is justification as it relates to our relationship with God. Now, at the moment of faith in Christ, God's righteousness is gifted to the believer. It is gifted to the believer. And as I mentioned in Romans 5.17, it's called the gift of righteousness. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21, uh, Paul writes, he says, He made him, that is, God made Christ while he was on the cross, he made him who knew no sin. Now remember that Jesus exists uh, in hypostatic union. Nearly 2,000 years ago, at a point in time, God the Son came into the world and took upon himself humanity. This happened in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and this was done supernaturally by means of God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and he came into this world minus a sin nature, and he went his entire life and committed no sin. And so when he says here that he made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus. And of course, when he went to the cross, he went to the cross not because of any sin of his own, not because of any guilt of his own. He was guilty of nothing. And if you read about the trials, and we covered the six illegal trials a few months ago, uh, which we talked about how Jesus was basically railroaded through this system, uh, this legal system and this religious system that existed at that time. It was, in fact, the greatest miscarriage of justice in the history of the human race. And yet Jesus allowed it to happen. He allowed it to happen. Remember John 10, 18, Jesus said, No man takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. And he did. He laid it down. He willingly went to the cross. He allowed this to happen to him. And so when he went to the cross, he went to the cross as one who knew no sin. Hebrews 4.15 says he was tempted in all ways like we are, yet without sin. 1 Peter 2.22 also makes it very clear that he knew no sin. And 1 John 3.5 says that in him there is no sin. And so he knew no sin, committed no sin, and in him there was no sin. And so he went to the cross, and when he was upon the cross, as he hung between heaven and earth, God the Father took all of the sins of humanity, that's my sins, your sins, the sins of everybody, and placed them on Christ, and there judged him as though it were us there at the cross, on the cross. And so he judged, he judged Christ in our place. And we looked at several uh, Greek prepositions, the Greek preposition on T, uh, uh, Mark 10, 45, Jesus said, the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And the word for there translates the Greek preposition on T, on T, A-N-T-I, and it's the preposition of substitution. And it means that Jesus died as our substitute on the cross. We also looked at several passages where, uh, in which we considered the other Greek preposition, huper, huper, H-U-P-E-R. Uh, Romans 5, uh, 8 says that God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died, huper, he died for us, he died in our place. 1 Peter 3.18 communicates the same idea, that Christ died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. And so 
we talked about how when Christ was upon the cross, he was judged in our place, the just for the unjust. And so he bore all of our sin. Now that happened 2,000 years ago. Now even though Christ died for everybody, he died for everybody. That's called unlimited atonement. Uh, And so Christ died for everybody. But the benefits of the cross are applied only to those who believe. It is applied only to those who believe. And we looked at uh, Acts 10.43, Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 2, and other passages related to that when we talked about forgiveness of sins. But nearly 2,000 years ago, it says here that he made him who knew no sin, that's Christ, to be sin on our behalf so that he took our sin upon himself so that we might become the righteousness of God. This is not our righteousness. This is the righteousness of God, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that prepositional phrase speaks to our union with Christ. Paul says in Philippians 3.9 that I may be found in him. Again, this is an identification truth, that I may be found in him. Notice, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Uh, So this is not a man-made righteousness. We can never produce enough good in in our lifetime to ever uh, measure up to the perfect standard of God's uh, of God's righteousness, and so Paul says, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that that what that righteousness is he's talking about here that which is through faith in Christ. Notice the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. This is the gift of righteousness. This is the right this is a top-down truth. This is the righteousness that comes from God to us on the basis of faith. So at the moment of faith in Christ, we receive the very righteousness of God. And at that moment, we are uh, the believer at that moment is at once made right with God and declared just in his sight. So Uh, Going on in the notes here, divine justification is not by human works at all, at all. Uh, Romans 10.3 says that there is none righteous, no, not even one. There is none righteous, no, not even one. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned. Now this speaks about the personal production of sin, because we talked about Adam's original sin, we talked about the sin nature uh, which every believer continues to have even after salvation. Uh, the power of sin has been clipped such that its tyrannical power uh, is no longer dominant. We do not have to surrender ourselves to the sin nature and to its temptations and pressures. Unfortunately, we do. Uh, and when we do, when we yield to pressure or pleasure, be it from within or from without, from Satan's world system, at that moment when we, from our volition, say yes to that temptation, at that moment we produce personal sin. And so Paul says here, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so in and of ourselves, we can never measure up to the perfect righteousness of God. But Romans 3.24 says, being justified as a gift... This is not by works. Remember, we're talking about a grace system, a grace system. And too often we fall into the trap of coming to God with a works system. Now, in the world, works is valid. I work uh, at a job and I get a paycheck. I worked for my education and I got several degrees, uh, undergraduate and uh, postgraduate degrees, a master's and a doctorate. And I earned those degrees, and God, by his grace, allowed me to have that education. And so there are things that we work for in this world. I work to have a good marriage. That's intentional. I sow into my marriage, and I want to love my wife. I want to be committed to her. And when I'm home, I need to be the best husband that I can be. And that means being here for her, with her, and uh, and to be the best that I can be for her. That takes work. And that's intentionality. And when what you sow is what you reap. And if you sow into those things, you will reap the blessings. And so works in this world system is very valid. It's a valid system in this world. And God created this system. But when it comes to our salvation, works do not apply. Only the work of Christ is what applies to our salvation. Uh, that we never, by our own human works, can ever measure up to the perfect righteousness of God. Uh, 
But God has given us His righteousness. You see, this is a grace system. We do not work for it. We do not earn it. We do not deserve it. If we got what we deserved, we would all be damned. We would all be dead. But we do not deserve this. And so this is the grace of God. It's unmerited favor. It's undeserved kindness. It's unwarranted love. And it comes to us from God, not because we're sweet and lovely, because we were not and we are not. Uh, but it comes to us via His grace and His love. And so we receive these blessings from God, uh, again, because of who He is. But we are said here to be justified as a gift. A gift. A gift by its very nature means it's free. It was costly to the giver, but free to the recipient. If you have to pay for it at all, if you have to do anything to earn it, it ceases to be a gift, and it becomes something that we bought either in part or in whole. Uh, And and work salvation is never acceptable before God. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says, For by grace, caught us unmerited favor, undeserved kindness, by grace you have been saved through faith. And as I've said a thousand times, and I'll say it a thousand more, faith does not save. God saves. Christ saves. Uh, But faith does not save. Faith is merely the instrument by which we receive that salvation. So by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. And that not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. It, that is salvation, is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, works should follow salvation, that's true, but they are never the condition of it. Never, never, never. And so we are justified, notice, as a gift, a gift, and don't miss that. And this by His grace, by His grace, because we do not earn it or deserve it. Uh, This is not based on anything in us that is sweet and lovely and attractive. It is by His grace. And through the redemption... The redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, we're going to talk about redemption in a future lesson, but here it translates the Greek noun, apolotrosis. And so this speaks about the work of Christ in which he he redeemed us from Satan's slave market of sin. And this because of his shed blood upon the cross, his precious blood, in which he purchased our salvation. And as I've mentioned before, the blood of Christ is the coin of the heavenly realm that God the Father accepts as payment for our sin debt. In fact, it is the only currency in heaven that God will accept as payment for our sin debt. So again, we have we are justified as a gift. It's free to us. By His grace, we don't earn it or deserve it. Through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, like our spiritual birth, justification is a one-and-done event, okay? And remember, we talked about the three phases of of our salvation. Uh, There is the initial salvation, where we are saved from the penalty of sin. We are being saved from the power of sin. That's our sanctification. And we will be saved from the very presence of sin. That's our glorification. But phase one, where we are saved from the penalty of sin, that is our justification, our justification. Justification is not a process. I want to be very clear on this. Sanctification is a process, but justification is an act. It occurs at a moment in time. At the moment of faith in Christ, we receive forgiveness of sin, subtraction. We receive the gift of righteousness. We receive the gift of eternal life. And at that moment, we are justified in God's sight once and for all. It's a once and, it's a one and done deal. Okay? So again, like our spiritual birth, justification is a one-and-done event, perfect in itself, not to be confused with our experiential sanctification, which occurs over time. According to Norman Geisler, he states, quote, Justification is an instantaneous uh, past act of God by which one is saved from the guilt of sin. His record is cleared and he is guiltless before God. Uh, end quote. And that's taken from his Systematic Theology, Volume 3, page 235. Charles Bing. I like Charles Bing. He's a, he's a solid Bible teacher, and if you can get a hold of his material, he's a good teacher too. And I have a quote here from his book, Grace, Salvation, and Discipleship. 
uh, in which he says, quote, justification is the act of God. It's the act of God that declares a sinner righteous in his sight. It is a legal term that, that speaks of one's right standing in God's court of justice, period. And notice it's where God declares the sinner righteous, where we are declared sin, uh, righteous in his sight. And we are declared righteous because of the gift of righteousness. This is not anything we produce. Now, our sanctification, I will spend multiple lessons on phase two of our salvation. Those are future lessons. Those are lessons that talk about our uh, spiritual growth. Now, that does involve a lot of works. That involves a lot of effort on our part. Listen, salvation is simple. It's all of Christ. It's very simple. Um, Now, sanctification, that's discipleship. That's tough. Sanctification requires you to have some skin in the game. Uh, So you're going to have to invest everything, your entire life, all of your life uh, must be surrendered to God. And this takes time. This doesn't happen overnight. This does take time. But discipleship, that's tough. And, uh, and so we'll talk about that in future lessons. But we must keep salvation clean, and we must keep it clear, and we must talk about it for what it is. And, uh, and so when he says that, we are de- that, that, this, that justification is the act of God that declares a sinner righteous in his sight, he says it is a legal term. It is a legal term because we're talking about God as judge. It is a legal term that speaks of one's right standing in God's, in God's court of justice, end quote. Now, being justified in God's sight is by faith alone and not by human works. And I've been driving this point, and I'll continue to drive this point. Romans 3.20 says, By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Let me say that again. By the works of the law. No flesh will be justified in his sight. Romans 4, 5 says, uh, but to the one who does not work, to the one who does not work. Now that, listen, Romans 4, 5 is an offense to the proud person. It is an offense to the believer who thinks that salvation comes by works. It is an offense to those who think they can earn God's salvation. And, and so it's, it's, it's an affront to them uh, because it's a blow to their pride. But the scripture is very clear. To the one who does not work, does not work. Salvation comes to the one who does not work, but believes in him that is in Christ, who justifies who? The ungodly. The ungodly, because we cannot save ourselves. We cannot. It is absolutely impossible. Salvation is all of Christ. It's what he did for us. But to the one who believes in him, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Galatians 2.16 says, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, is not justified by the works of the law. How are we justified? Uh, We are justified through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified, notice, by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. Now, I have a quote here by Packer, and there's things I like about Packer and things I don't like about Packer, uh, but I do think he's correct here. He says, quote, Justification is a judicial act of God pardoning sinners, wicked, ungodly persons, accepting them as just, and so putting them permanently right, and so putting permanently right their previously estranged relationship with himself. This justifying sentence is God's gift of righteousness his bestowal of a status of acceptance for Jesus' sake, end quote. Louis Burkhoff, again, a guy that I like and things I don't like about him, but I do think he's correct here. I think he's correct here. He's one of the older Reformed theologians. He says, quote, Justification is a judicial act of God in which he declares on the basis of the righteousness of Jesus Christ that all the claims of the law are satisfied with respect to the sinner. 
It is unique in the application of the work of redemption in that it is a judicial act of God, a declaration respecting the sinner and not an act or process of renewal such as regeneration, conversion, and sanctification. He goes on, he says, while it has respect to the sinner, it does not change his inner life. It does not affect his condition, but his state, end quote. Uh, Now, I'm going to take a moment to talk about that last last couple sentences there. He says, while while it has uh, respect to the sinner, he says it does not change his inner life. Now, that's sanctification. That comes after we are justified in God's sight. He says it does not affect his condition, that is, uh, his inner condition. It, It does not affect his condition, but his state, that is, his standing before God. Now, when we are born again, we receive a new nature. We do receive God the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. And at that moment, we enter into phase two of the Christian life, which is our sanctification. Now, that does affect our condition. Merrill F. Unger, a Bible teacher that I greatly love and appreciate, and here I'm citing him from his Unger's Bible Dictionary, page 729. He says, quote, Justification is a divine act whereby an infinitely holy God judicially declares a believing sinner to be righteous and acceptable before him because Christ has borne the sinner's sin on the cross and has become to us righteousness. He goes on, he says, A justified believer emerges from God's great courtroom with a consciousness that another, his substitute, has borne his guilt and that he stands without accusation uh, before God. And that's correct. Romans 8 1, he cites there, which says, There is there is now, there he says, therefore there is now no condemnation. For who? For those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul ends, I have a quote here from his Moody Handbook of Theology, and it's quite a lengthy quote. Uh, and This is from his Moody Handbook of Theology, page 326. He says, quote, if I can get to it here, he says, whereas forgiveness is the negative side of salvation. And let me pause for a moment. Remember that, that when we think about salvation, we think about subtraction, the forgiveness of sins, okay? And so there is that aspect of the salvation, which it is removal. But salvation is also addition. It is what we receive. So going back to his quote here, he says, whereas forgiveness is the negative side of salvation, justification is the positive side. To justify is to declare righteous the one who has faith in Christ. He goes on, he says, It is a forensic act of God whereby he declares the believing sinner righteous on the basis of the blood of Christ. The major emphasis of justification, he says, is positive and involves two main aspects. It involves the pardon and removal of all sins and the end of separation from God. Let me pause there for just a moment because he's correct that it involves the pardon and separation of all sins and the end of separation from God. He goes on, he says, it also involves the bestowal of righteousness uh, upon the believing person and a title to all the blessings promised to the just. Now, let me pause there for a moment. Uh, So he says it involves the bestowal of righteousness. So that has to do with the gift of righteousness. Now, he goes on. He says justification is a gift. He says justification is a gift given through the grace of God. I've already talked about that. He goes on. He says, and it takes place at the moment the individual has faith in Christ. The ground of justification is the death of Christ, apart from any works. The means of justification is faith. Uh, He goes on, he closes out, he says, through justification God maintains his integrity and his standard, yet is able to enter into fellowship with sinners because they have the very righteousness of Christ imputed to them, end quote. Again, because they have the very righteousness of Christ imputed to them. Uh, Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, having been justified, notice not by works, not by the law, not by anything we do, having been justified by faith, we have, at that moment, he says what? Peace with God, and this through uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
But that peace is a relational peace. It's not the mental attitude of peace. The mental attitude of peace comes over time as we take in the Word of God, we learn it, we live it, and we learn to trust God at His Word. And uh, it produces a relaxed mental attitude within the soul of the believer. Uh, that is a mental attitude of peace that comes over time through our sanctification. But this is relational peace, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the process is faith in Christ. So that's what happens. We, we trust in Christ as our Savior. And once we trust in Christ as our Savior, we then receive the gift of righteousness. We then receive the very righteousness of God that is given to us on the basis of faith. And the declaration by God that the believer is now justified in God's sight, that the believer is now justified in God's sight. And again, Romans 3.24, that we are justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And to the one who does not work but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, His faith is credited as righteousness. I have a quote here by uh, Robert B. Thiem, Jr., and this is from his uh, uh, Thiem's Bible Doctrine Dictionary. He says, quote, Anyone who expresses faith alone in Christ alone is instantly justified before the bench of God's justice. He says the mechanics of justification follow three logical steps, uh, though they all occur simultaneously. First, the person believes in Christ. Second, God the Father credits or imputes his righteousness to that person. And third, God recognizes his righteousness in the believer and pronounces him justified, vindicated, righteous, end quote. And it's absolutely correct. And so again, we are justified in the sight of God, not by works. It's a gift. It's a gift because we receive the very gift of righteousness that has been imputed to us and God looks into us and he sees his righteousness within us and he says, justified, justified. And again, this is not by works, very clear. Uh, again, Romans 3.24, that we are justified as a gift by his grace. We don't earn it or deserve it through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Now, the imputation of God's righteousness to believers means that we are declared righteous, but not made righteous in conduct. To be righteous in conduct is the lifelong process of sanctification. Sanctification. And we're going to get there, so just be patient. Here in a few months, we'll, we'll, we'll move into phase two of, sanctifi of our salvation. We'll talk about sanctification. But again, we want to be very clear here that the imputation of God's righteousness to believers means we are declared righteous, but we are not made righteous in conduct. To be righteous in conduct is the lifelong process of sanctification, whereby the believer advances to spiritual maturity and lives in conformity with the character of with lives in conformity with the character and will of God as revealed in his word. Um now, going on in the notes here, but though we are righteous in God's sight because of the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, at the same time, we continue to possess a sin nature that continually causes internal temptation and conflict. And so we do. We continue to bear that sin nature. Uh, Paul talks about our old self, our old self, that is our carnal flesh that we continue to uh, have within us. Uh, Paul says in Romans uh, 13, 14, he says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ, notice, and make no provision for the flesh. Now here he's talking to believers, to believers. And when he says make no provision for the flesh, he's talking about that sinful proclivity that we have and continue to have even after salvation. Uh, and so when he says make no provision for the flesh, uh, I take that to mean uh, don't expose yourself to the things that excite the flesh. Don't expose yourself to the things that excite the flesh. And so uh, Paul in Galatians 5.17 says, uh, here again talking to believers, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And the word flesh there translates the Greek word sarks. Sarks. 
Now, that can mean physical flesh in some contexts where it just refers to the flesh of our body. Uh, on other occasions, it refers to the sinful flesh that we have within us. Again, that proclivity that wants to behave contrary to the character of God and the Word of God. Uh, but he says, uh, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And then he talks about what goes on in the believer in Romans 5.17. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. And so we will deal with this ongoing war throughout our lives. We will deal with this throughout our lives. Now the reality is, is that as believers, we continue not only to possess a sin nature, but we also continue to possess or, or to commit personal acts of sin. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, There is not a righteous man on the earth who continually does good and who never sins. 1 John uh, 1.10 says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And the word sin there translates the Greek verb hamartano, and there it speaks to the production of, uh, of the will. And then also uh, 1 John 2, 1, he says, My little children, talking to believers, I am writing to you so that you may not sin. Now let me pause for a moment. It's never, never, never the will of God that we sin. But notice what he says in the latter part of verse 1. And if anyone sins, if anyone there talking about believers, uh, because believers do sin, he says, if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And so believers do commit personal acts of sin. And though the power of the sin nature is broken, the presence of the sin nature uh, is never removed from us until God takes us from this world and gives us a new body like the body of Jesus. And in the future, we will come to possess a new body like the body of Jesus. And we're looking forward to that. Philippians 3.20 says, For our citizenship is in heaven. You see, I have a citizenship status in heaven right now. I've not been there. I have yet to go, and, and my future destiny will be heaven. And I have a right to be there because I have, I hold citizenship status in heaven. He says, Paul says here, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait, for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this refers to phase three of our salvation. Notice verse 21, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So he will transform this body uh, this body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. Well, what kind of body does he have? Well, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now we know that we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared as, as yet what we will be. But notice he says, We know that when he appears, we will be like him. Now, that's important. Don't miss that. When he appears, we will be like him. But 1 John 3, 5 says, You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So when he appears, uh, we know that when he appears, we will be like him, and in him there is no sin. So that's our future state. It will be free from the contaminants of the sinful flesh. Now, I have a reference here to Martin Luther who understood this duality uh, between our new nature that wants to serve God. Paul talks about that in Romans 7. He says, I agree with the law of God in my inner man. And so there's that new nature that wants to serve God. He says, yet I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. And so there's that conflict. And Martin Luther understood this duality. And Martin Luther had a lot of things right. He got some goofy stuff. His views on, on the Jews was just horrendous. I mean, his anti-Semitism was just completely, completely 100% out of line. Uh, but even though we can uh, say wrong, wrong, wrong on, on certain things about Luther, I do think there were some things that he got right. And by the way, isn't that true for all Christians? Isn't that true for all of us? I don't ever claim to have uh, absolute... Um, uh, perfection on all of my theology. My theology is in a state of refinement constantly. And I've been studying the Word of God for upwards of 30 years now, and I'm still refining. It's never, it's never going to stop. 
And there are things I teach now that I didn't teach 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago because as I grow in the Word of God, I'm constantly being refined. Uh, but uh, it's one of these things where sometimes I find uh, other Christians, and I've run into this in the seminary, unfortunately, where somebody will say, oh, well, I don't agree with somebody on a certain doctrine, they're wrong. And the other person is wrong on that particular doctrine. They may be right on 80% or 90% of the other things they teach, but they'll say, oh, well, they're wrong on this thing, therefore I'm not going to read anything that they put out. And I think that that's misplaced. I think that's misplaced. I sometimes, while I do quote uh, some Calvinistic Reformed theologians, I don't agree with them. I'm not a Calvinist. I don't subscribe to TULIP. There's aspects of it that I do like, but I'm not a Calvinist. And, uh, and so I, I, but still, there's areas where I can agree with them. I can agree with Sproul on some things. I can agree with Grudem on some things. I can agree with Packer on some things. I can agree with some of these guys. There's stuff about their teaching I don't like, uh, but again, there are areas where their teaching is correct, and that's why I cite them. And I reference Luther here. So Martin Luther understood this duality and coined the Latin phrase, simul justus et peccator. Simul justus et peccator. It's a Latin phrase, and it translates as simultaneously righteous and a sinner. Simultaneously righteous and a sinner. So though Christians are declared righteous in God's sight, sin will con still constantly be present. Uh, and this to varying degrees, depending on the believer's uh, on the status of the believer's spiritual walk with the Lord, because we're on that track where we are pursuing righteousness more and more and more and more in our daily walk with the Lord. We ought to be, we ought to be moving in that direction, and the advancing believer will demonstrate more and more uh, the righteousness that is communicated in God's word. Uh, but sin will never disappear. It will never disappear. Now, uh, Timothy George, and I have a quote from him from a book I read a few years ago, a very good book. It's called Theology of the Reformers. A pretty good read. I enjoyed it. And he addresses the subject of uh, simul justus et peccator. He says, quote, The believer is not only both righteous and sinful at the same time, but is also always completely both righteous and sinful at the same time. What does this mean, he says? With respect to our fallen human condition, we are and always will be in this life sinners. However, for believers, life in this world is no longer a period of doubtful candidacy for God's acceptance. In a sense, we have already been before God's judgment seat and have been acquitted on account of Christ. Hence, we are also always righteous." End quote. So you see how he's addressing both the sinful nature and the proclivity and the production of sin that will exist in the life of the believer, but also how we are righteous before God because of the gift of righteousness, and at that moment we are declared uh, just in the sight of God. Now I agree with the phrase simul justus et peccator, uh, that a Christian is simultaneously righteous and a sinner. I think a better phrase and I didn't come up with this, but I'm certainly going to use it, I think a better phrase is semper justus et peccator, uh, that we are always righteous and a sinner. You see, I am always righteous in the sight of God because of the gift of righteousness that was given to me, and so I've been justified, I've been declared just in his sight. And this, an ungodly person uh, who has been declared just in his sight because of the gift of righteousness. So both are true. Always. As a Christian, I am righteous because I have received God's gift of righteousness. This is, according to Philippians 3.9, again, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. God gave me his righteousness at the moment I trusted Christ as my Savior, and like all of God's gifts, it can't be given back. Uh, Romans 11.29 says, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, as one who possesses God's righteousness, I am forever justified in his sight. The matter is settled in heaven. God has made it so. And after being saved, the issue for every Christian is to advance to spiritual maturity, uh, which glorifies God and edifies others. You see, we are to press on to maturity. God wants us to grow up. And so there are aspects of, of our salvation that are entirely the work of God, 100% the work of God. 
in that he solved the problem of sin. That's at the cross. God solved the problem of sin. I can produce sin, but I can't deal with sin. And I can do good works, but my good works never, never measure up to the perfect righteousness of God. So I'm in a helpless position. In fact, the Bible says I'm helpless. Romans 5, 6 calls me helpless. Okay? So, God solved the problem of sin. He solved it by sending his son into the world. Because God the Son came into this world and was supernaturally conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Came into this world minus sin. He had no sin nature. And he went his entire life and he committed no sin. And then he went to the cross and he died a penal substitutionary death. Penal. He bore the penalty for my sin. Substitutionary. He died in my place. The just for the unjust, Peter tells us. And he died a penal substitutionary death. And he did die. He died upon the cross. He died physically and he died spiritually in the sense that he was separated from God in time for three hours. Uh, From noon to three when the sky grew dark, he bore my sin and the sin of all humanity upon the cross. And so he died, he was buried, he was resurrected on the third day, which demonstrates that he conquered both sin and death. He did it. He did it. He is the hero. He did it. He is the one who brought about our salvation because we can't. It's impossible. And salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is never, never what we do for God. Salvation is always what God has done for us through the work of Jesus Christ who died on the cross, who bore our sin on the cross. And and at the moment of faith in Christ... According to Acts 10.43, it says, whoever believes in him, whoever, that's anybody, because salvation is open to everybody. It's unlimited atonement. Christ died for everybody. The ball is in your court. What are you going to do with that? Are you going to believe in Christ? Because Acts 10.43 says, whoever believes in him, and it's faith alone in Christ alone. Uh, It's never by works that we do. Never by works that we do. Whoever believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Lombano receives, takes possession of that thing. And so we receive the benefit of forgiveness of sins. And and remember that salvation is subtraction. It's, It's the forgiveness of sins, but it's addition. It's the gift of righteousness. It's the gift of eternal life. But... Once we come into that relationship with God, once we are born again, once we receive forgiveness of sins, once we receive the gift of righteousness, once we receive the gift of eternal life, once we receive all these things that make us right with God, God then wants us to grow up. He wants us to advance to spiritual maturity. But when we think of our salvation, phase one, that's 100% of God. That's 100% Him. It is all of Him. He saves. And we are just the fortunate beneficiaries. We are sinners. We are helpless. We are ungodly. We are dead in our trespasses and sins. And we cannot save ourselves. For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And so we want to keep that Uh, in its place. We want to understand that that justification is an act of God 100%. Now, once we get into sanctification, phase two of the Christian life, that requires us to have some skin in the game. It requires us to study. It requires us to learn God's Word, to live God's Word, and to advance to spiritual maturity. And when we live that way, that glorifies God, that edifies others. And so that's what we want. Now, we're going to get there, but I'm currently looking at this uh, from the perspective of, again, our relationship to God and what he did for us uh, with regard to our salvation. All right, so that is going to close out today's lesson, and I hope that this has been helpful to you. If you've been following this series of lessons, then you have caught a lot of repetition because it's through the repetition that we learn these things. And so I hope that this lesson has been helpful to you, and I thank you very much, and I wish you a blessed day.